I loved my second grade teacher. One day, it was picture day, and I completely forgot. She grabbed a comb and decided to attempt her Coretta Scott Kingish bouffant comeback <laughs> thing, this side swoop. One day, I was particularly ornery, and she grabbed my wrist and said, Melissa, you are not being your best. And I was angry. She grabbed my hand. I was going to tell my mama. <laughs> I was seething in my seat. She saw me. She called me outside, gave me a cupcake, and said, I'm sorry for grabbing your wrist, but you are not being your best. Sit out here, eat this cupcake, and join us when you're ready. <laughs> Fast forward to eighth grade, and I'm sitting in my math class. My teacher comes over and gently places her hand on my shoulder, and she says to me, you're pretty smart for a black girl. And I remember responding, thank you? <laughs> Unsure what to do with that comment and those emotions that came with it, I went to my principal, who I had a rapport with, and I told him what happened. He sat back in his chair, he sighed, and he said, I'll handle it. A few days later, I was in class, and she came to me with this confused face and she said, I'm sorry if I offended you with what I said, but I just wanted you to know that I think you're smart. And it was clear to me that she was completely unaware of how problematic her statement was, how it made me feel. A few days later, I go to my English class where we had the results of a test that told us what reading level we were at, what grade we were reading. So in the eighth grade, I was reading at an 11th grade level. Jerry a white boy who was sitting next to me, his test said he was reading at a 12th grade level. And I remember thinking, that must be what she means. Fast forward, my son is getting prepared to enter kindergarten, and I have a lot of anxiety around it. I wondered, how do I go about putting my son in a space to limit these types of biases, these types of interactions with teachers? So I worked with some parents to create a homeschool cooperative where we use the information and the knowledge of the group and the resources in the community to teach our children. We started off with two African-American families. We blossomed to seven, then 14 children. And more people continued to inquire about what we we're doing and asking us how to be a part. Then I began to wonder why they want to be in a cooperative in the first place. What was the impetus that made them want to move their children from traditional schools. So I asked the parents. Then I asked African-American families who were homeschooling across the nation. And one thing remained consistent. Every family who decided to homeschool their children either had a negative interaction with the teacher when they were students or a negative interaction with the teacher from their children. So what we find, research tells us, that teachers' histories are important when it comes to the classroom. They bring those stories that guide how they choose curriculum, how they choose to teach, and how they interact with their students. What we also know is that we have to be careful about how we interact with our children and how we think about the work that we're doing with them. So I began to wonder, how do those microscopic interactions with teachers that have that underlying bias, how might that be replicated or manifest in macroscopic situations? How might these interactions be supported in state and federal policies that affect education? So we know that African American children, particularly boys, are dis disproportionately disciplined. They're giving more suspensions than their white counterparts for the same infractions. We know that African American children are disproportionately placed in special education. They're also disproportionately medicated in the school system. We also know that states like Alabama, Virginia, 
in my home state of Florida has race-based academic standards. Let that sit for a moment. Race-based academic standards. So what that means is a white child may be required to pass at 80%, where a black child is required to pass at 60. So what does that mean for our children? Who are we telling who can and can't be intelligent? How are we preparing our children for the next grade, for college? I then began to look at teacher demographics and student demographics. So I looked at how, who's in this classroom, right? So we know that children of color have doubled in the last 30 years in the K-12 system. We know that 22% of children live in poverty. And we know that 10% of students in the K-12 system are English language learners. Yet, our teacher workforce remains predominantly female, white, middle class, and monolingual English speakers. We also know that there's challenges around retention in urban and rural areas where this diversity is most concentrated. So universities and teacher preparation programs have recognized this. And they've created diversity training programs, which generally are categorized in three different categories. First, it's conservative, in which teachers are told that children should be assimilating into mainstream norms and removing any cultural differences. Liberal, which tells teachers to tolerate difference. And third, and the least utilized, is critical. Critical requires teachers to investigate the influences of power, oppression, dominance, and inequity that manifests in the classroom and extends into federal policies. So who's doing this? Who's able to think about these large macroscopic issues and make them relatable and digestible to a lay audience? Artists and museum educators. I argue that when we incorporate art, critical self-reflection, storytelling, and peer dialogue into professional development, we prepare teachers to be better leaders as they reflect on their own biases that they bring into the classroom. That increases their engagement and strong relationships with their students and have higher academic achievement in the classroom. So let's take this image. I ask teachers, what do you see? Oftentimes they say, I see two black male figures, maybe two friends, maybe a father and son. Then I say, tell me a little bit about them. Who are they? And I get a myriad of stories. But I always get, something isn't right here. Something's wrong. They're up to something. They're violent. Then I say, what do you see that makes you say that? And oftentimes, they can't put their finger on what exactly they see what exactly evoked that emotion. But as we go through this inquiry-based process, what those teachers tend to find is that they have deep-seated stories about who these black boys are or aren't. In the same way they brought those stories to this painting, they bring those stories to those boys that show up in their classes. Critically conscious museum educators are experts at having this inquiry-based interaction. They're great at having this dialogue around images that, have, that encompass these large issues. They're able to create engaging and participatory activities that make the complex simple. They can harness that learning power within museums, and they can do it within an hour. My colleague, Kiona Hendrick, and I created a process called Multicultural Critical Reflective Practice. It's an ongoing process that ask teachers to identify, analyze, and challenge those cultural beliefs, values, and assumptions that color their interactions with their students. It can't be boxed. It's a blend of different approaches. We ask these teachers to confront their preconceived notions that guide their relationships with their students. 
it's an uncomfortable session. We bring up these emotions and these deep-seated stories that they didn't realize they had. We evoke emotions for change. We believe when you feel it, you can identify it, you have something to hold on to, something you can change. So what happens when we incorporate the works of Emory Douglas, or Kehinde Wiley, or Micheline Thomas, or Titus Kafor, or Wanjechi Mutu. What happens when we get these images to ask people, to ask our teachers, to dig into the deep recesses of their minds and harness those problematic concepts that they've been socialized and been, and been told to internalize? Well, we found that it's working. As we're doing this work across the country with educators, they're better prepared to have conversations around race, sexuality, gender, cultural differences. Professors are better equipped to teach their teachers to have these engaging and conscious interactions with their, with their students. And K-12 teachers are more conscious about their curriculum choices and their interactions with their students. So what happens? We know when we engage students, we lessen dropout rates. We increase academic performance. When we have a more intellectual workforce, we know that we have more productive citizens. So what happens when we ask social workers, nonprofit leaders, police officers to do this critical self-reflection, to ask them to critically think about the communities they've been charged to help, support, and protect. Maybe we get people like my second grade teacher. Ms. Whitehurst, I don't know where you are right now, but I thank you. I thank you for telling me to be my best and expecting nothing less. I thank you for seeing my humanness and complexity. I thank you for helping me see and believe in what you saw in me. Thank you. <laughs>